Hello. Oh, got it. Yeah. Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to our first Distinguished Visiting Lecturer Grand Round series series of this year coming. And uh, we get to have a real kickoff to the series today. Um, it's my um, true pleasure to introduce Dr. John Graydon from the University of Michigan. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about him, although in some ways he needs no introduction. Um, but uh, I first want to start out by uh, saying two things on a more personal note. Um, one is that uh, Dr. Graydon is a son of Minnesota. And he's come back to where his roots uh, uh, run deep. Um, not only does he have colleagues sitting in the audience from, from during his training days, he himself was a trainee here, earning both his bachelor's degree and his MD at the University of Minnesota, completing his internship at Harbor UCLA and his psychiatry residency here at the University of Minnesota Hospitals, and then at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, DC. So it's very fun to, for you to have that connection and for you to be back here today. Um, again, on a personal note, I, I had an interest in, in Dr. Grid not just because of um, his, uh, you know, an international reputation as a depression researcher, and as I would say, as a as a field of depression catalyst. Um, as we become interested in pulling together our own mood disorders program um, in a kind of a way, but also because he was a department chair of a very prestigious um, university. Uh, Department of Psychiatry at the University of Michigan um, for over 20 years, and so I knew would have insights into um, what does it take to sort of build a successful Department of Psychiatry um, in the Midwest region, and indeed, he's already provided me with some really invaluable advice and coaching, and particularly around um, in areas of philanthropy where you've been particularly successful. Um, so I, I personally am appreciative for, for, for that um, expertise that you're bringing here today. Um, but what we're going to focus on in the grand rounds is on the topic of depression. And uh, Dr. Graydon is the executive director of the University of Michigan Comprehensive Depression Center, Rachel Upjohn, professor of psychiatry and clinical neurosciences, research professor in the Molecular and Behavioral Neuroscience Institute, and then I think many of you here know, founder and chair of the National Network of Depression Centers, which I suspect we'll be hearing a little bit um, more about um, as, as the talk goes on. Um, I'm just going to allow it to go without saying. I'm not going to go into a lot of details. He's uh, authored or co-authored, you know, hundreds of um, articles. Uh, he's been involved in hundreds of, of guest lectures. He has almost three decades of NA, NIH funding as an investigator or co-investigator. And his themes have focused on uh, really um, understanding depression, the biology of depression, biomarkers, treatment development strategies um, to focus on prevention of recurrence of depression. But he has also really seen uh, part of this role as being very involved in public education and public outreach, and, in and indeed the depression center that he founded, as well as the National Network of Depression Centers, has really um, uh, played a key role in that area, helping to de depression um, and helping to bring public awareness and the awareness of policymakers to the importance of treating depression. I could go on and on with his, with his many accomplishments, uh, but I think it's going to be much more exciting for all of us if I turn it over to you and we get to, uh, again, benefit from your expertise in this area. Thank you. First to test. Can you hear me? Sophia, thank you for really that very gracious introduction. And it really is a treat, and including seeing uh, colleagues from a different day and age. <laughs> and uh, it's wonderful to be back here. We have family that is from southeastern Michigan. And um, literally, Renee and I are the only ones who, who migrated. So. Uh, Family in Rochester, Winona, Rolling Stone, Altura, <laughs> Minneapolis, St. Paul. So it's always, uh, we're back here, but it's a special treat to kind of be back here in this capacity. I'm going to try to, well, first let me get rid of the other stuff. This is the compulsory part that essentially says I have no conflicts that I'm going to be talking about today. I may make some reference to ketamine, and it still is a research tool. 
But uh, you can look at things. Uh, these are all just consulting stuff, but they're not there. And um, very few people are old enough in this auditorium right now to be able to pick up on this. This used to be the building directly across the street on Harvard Street, Phyro Sigma Medical Fraternity. I lived, whoops, sorry, uh, that way. I lived in, uh, let's go backwards, in uh, the room that you can't see back there from my first year of medical school. <laughs> And, um, and it was, I just walked across the street to go to the classrooms, and uh, very few people would remember that. Well, because it was so close, it was a temptation for people to cheat. And, uh, and at some point, we had to develop a strategy to kind of penalize those who parked on our front lawn. Well, you get 15 medical students together, and you can be big enough to pick a car up, and we put it on the steps uh, right there once, and so the person no longer parked on our front lawn. <laughs> so, and, and otherwise, the only part of the heritage that I remember from back then is, is uh, Herb and Stubbs or you know, whatever, the bar that used to be, and it's still there. So uh, let's talk about these. And what I'd really like to do is to just try and move through a story that many of you know. And it's going to be, uh, for some who don't, I just have felt obliged to provide a little background. We're talking about what the World Health Organization just designated in March as the most disabling illness in the world, clinical depression. I also will talk about bipolar, but uh, the most, you know, everybody, you say that to people in cardiology or cancer and they giggle, you know, but it's true. Multiple reasons for it. We'll talk about those. Um, something that I'm trying to not be uh, glib about is really an important concept. There is no such thing as depression. There are depressions. Long ago, cancer stopped talking about cancer as if it was a single entity. It's time for us to join that, that parade and uh, to recognize that we have heterogeneity and multiple causes. And I'm getting a little feedback. Can, is, that, is it okay? Okay. Um, and so we're going to look at these. And then at the end, I just have to talk a little bit about something else. I'm going to just toss out something and we'll see where it goes and then we can have time for discussion. This one sometimes when I've shown it, it's actually a slide that's the courtesy of Husseini Manji, who's a friend, used to be at NIMH, Janssen, J&J &J now. But uh, um, he did one of these and I sort of adapted it to personalized precision treatment. So our history Quite interesting. One time we drilled holes in people's heads to let out evil spirits. Another time we developed markers, feeling lumps on the skull. We moved into ideas to try to personalize very early, and that goes back to Freudian things. Uh, uh, at some stage, people started to say, there's a brain under there. We should better understand it. And it started to lead to first regular imaging. And then it got more sophisticated, and then the era of genetics moved in. And I'm probably most importantly, this past decade, we're into mobile monitoring and uh, how can we put various parameters together and have fingerprints, if you will, and ultimately move to the right treatment for the right person and the right dose at the right time, personalized precision treatment. Can we get there? Okay. So I've already said this. This is Tom Inso, who's now actually with, not verily, if it says it on there, that's because it's an old slide, but uh, it doesn't. Um, he is now with MindStrong. He's left NIMH, and he's with a company in Silicon Valley. But Tom has been a voice for this for some time, saying it's the most important thing. I'm going to give you just the big global reasons why. So... I've already said it, one size treatment will never fit all because we've got heterogeneous causes, but we don't think that way. We don't start that way. And that's largely, I think, something that is 
a real challenge to us. It's not easy to change cultures. Um, so we're dealing with common illnesses. One of every six of us, that's the conservative one, has depression. And six of six are affected um, because if you have depression in your family, it's going to impact everybody. And I think um, in the framework of this, if they're so common, one of six, and that's the conservative one, some say one of four, why don't we screen everybody? And um, we should. Inadequate networks, we're going to talk about that. Small samples, no computational aspects. Next week, I understand from Sophia, you actually have a speaker who is famous for that term, computational psychiatry. You're getting Josh Gordon, who is the director of NIMH, and he'll give you a great talk. Um, and then finally, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit, but biomarkers, <laughs> pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, they're all probably essential ingredients in making our steps to getting into precision treatment, and we can do this. So uh, those gaps have to be filled, and that's the piece I would like to sort of say, can we partner? Before I do it, just pick out, well, let's do this with, I gotta stand this way because the light otherwise hits me, medical things. Just name me some things that produce a depression phenotype. We'll stay with depression for now rather than bipolar. Say it, heart disease, absolutely. One in three, by the way, for heart disease. One of every three people who has a myocardial infarct or coronary or congestive heart failure has depression. And your odds of dying are about double or triple during the next year. So right away, no matter what you name, I'll probably give you a comment. <laughs> so uh, what else? Hypothyroidism, of course. And uh, some more? Insomnia. Insomnia, okay. Sleep disturbances in general. So one more, two more. Parkinson's, ooh, I met yesterday. With, uh, we had a discussion about uh, uh, REM behavior disorder, and, uh, and I think that this is just in general, parasomnias. There's one more in there that I'm going to focus on a little bit just because of its commonality. What, what is it? Diabetes. diabetes. Oh, I was, I was still back at the sleep, but diabetes too. But something called sleep apnea. Yeah, so we'll talk about a few of these. Now, if those all can produce a phenotype that is comparable, do you think they all respond to the same treatment? Are they all going to do well if given escitalopram or if given, uh, you know, any of the ones you want to name? The answer is no. So that's my list, and it's by no means complete. It's just one that does, stops fitting on a slide after a while, but I've used this with our residents at Michigan. And if you just start picking up, this is where we've lived for a couple decades. But if you march down, we didn't even know that glutamatergic stuff was relevant until the ketamine story came along and all of us, oh my gosh, <laughs> well, it was there, you know, and it was, maybe those were some of the people who weren't responding. And the neurotrophins uh, terminology that 15 years ago didn't exist, it's now clearly relevant and even probably a good biomarker. I'm not going to go through this whole thing because we'll talk about some of them, but chronophysiology, clock genes, seasonal, the inflammation story, chronic pain, opioids, somewhere in here we probably should find diabetes, I hope. <laughs> um, <laughs> where is it? <laughs> yeah, over here. Um, and, you know, and even in some cases, things that produce deficiencies. Well, with that list and, and this caveat is, I just use this as a teaching thing, and I've given it out to residents in our setting. I don't know that they use it, but to say, have it as something to think about whenever you're doing your intake evaluation. Because starting up here, oh, you meet the DSM criteria for major depressive disorder, if you'll excuse my crassness, it doesn't help very much. <laughs> and I was going to say one damn bit, you know, because it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't tell you what to do for precision treatment. So heterogeneity plus reliance upon one-size treatment explains 
the key data that we have remained in that cluster of once three and then two, and now the number one most disabling disorder, because we're not making progress on treating in a precise, specific way. And this goes, we were part of STAR-D, I liked it. Uh, it was a good study, and yet this always distressed me. This is my diagram, but it actually comes from John Rush and Maduka Trivedi in the data. So all of you have depression, every one of you now. Major depressive disorder, you get treated. Conventional treatment, standardized, well-established NIH project. Only 37% of you get better. That's it. You know, just as a starting point in one thing. 37%, whoa, you know. And we live with this assumption that everybody gets better. Now, if we take that group and we treat you with some next steps, and I'm not going to go through the design of STAR-D, it's complex, we can get some more. Now we've moved the bar up to 58% or something total that are responding. But 30% of that group that's remaining can get better with next steps. So there's still something going on up there. Maybe it's just time. Then you end up having, now we got to really start switching around. And we're moving into different categorizations and MAOIs and T3 and, and lithium and, and that group and that group. How many are getting better? You know, while you're looking at 37, 30, 13, 13. So if you've gone through three failures, your odds of getting somebody better by saying, I'm going to try another sequence of traditional antidepressant stuff or augmentation, 13%. You know, there's something happening because we aren't into anything that's being guided a little bit by precision recommendations, by, if you will, understanding what's the underpinning. This is a nice diagram that just shows the same thing, so there's no difference. And then we face that. It says, of course you feel great. These things are loaded with <laughs> antidepressants. The bottom line is that these remain our first or second most prescribed medications. Why? Because conventionally, this is something that's so common, and we're using first-line approaches. And that's the way they were even promoted. And I was part of it. You know, I did consulting with pharmaceutical companies, and we talked about your first-line treatment, and you fought to you know, Prozac's now the first-line treatment. It's no longer a mepramine or, you know, or something. And, uh, and the first-line treatment is probably something we shouldn't be thinking about anymore. We ought to be thinking about what is the most knowledgeable guideline that we can come up with for the most personalized and precise and this is otherwise what we have. It says, we treated you with three antidepressants, and they didn't help, so we're going to treat you for symptom deficit disorder. <laughs> That's a little sarcastic. But it's, if you look, it, it is not a knock. We use it. I use it. You all have to use it because our insurance companies do. But that little designation there, and all of the fight, and I'm not into at all the fight of RDOC versus DSM. Anytime anybody's using the word versus, I get a little upset because almost always there's something to be learned from both directions. And it's not this as much as what can we gather. But at this point, RDOC has been a little bit of a villain for us in this field because it gives us a label. It doesn't tell us what is likely to work for this person's phenomenological phenotype. It doesn't. And we need to acknowledge that. Not at all. And so in any way whatsoever. So in that context, I tried to simplify this once. It was seven steps. And, you know, and then I realized I was having trouble remembering them, and I still can't. Um, so I think if we're going to get there, and this is very fundamental stuff, and then we'll talk a little bit at the end about what do we go for? Where do we go with the real science? But screening and monitoring everyone, when you think of the commonality and the prevalence, is probably a pretty good step for us to start with right now. Why aren't we? Because, again, culture and tradition. And in some cases, people object. I don't want my child screened for being a likely candidate for having depression. <clears throat> well, wouldn't you rather know? You know? And yet, parents aren't always happy. Uh, number two, 
search for, I'm not going to go back to it now, but that list that I had, search for and think and treat all likely and present phenotypes at the same time. I, I care but it's sometimes here, Sophia and I have been talking a little bit about how do you integrate various things and addictions um, integrate with a lot of things. So you can have schizophrenia and have tobacco addiction. You can have uh, depression or bipolar and have, with bipolar, it's 65, 70% cocaine and alcohol and uh, you know a variety of other kinds of things. Whatever it is, you end up having co-occurrences. And I used to battle with the people in our alcohol program, the residents, and they would say, well, let's treat the alcohol problem first and then the depression will clear up. And I would say, how do you know that? <laughs> and what happens if it doesn't get better or something? Why don't you just go after whatever think is happening, search for other reasons. And uh, so it's not easy though, and, but it can help to be guided by a list. So treating at the same time and having a list, and this one, sadly, we still don't have very often, but we're getting there, we're starting to get there, biomarkers. And then the last ones, we'll spend the last few minutes talking about that. I've been talking about it with some of the people I've been meeting today. <laughs> uh, I'll give you some one now, just a very quick thing since I've said it a couple times. I edited a journal once for eight years, Journal of Psychiatric Research, and I used to get all these articles and they frustrated me because they would come in with 35 subjects, quote, and 34 controls. And then I had the fortune, and this is 20 years ago, uh, to join our University of Michigan Cancer Center Executive Committee for a while. And I was sitting listening to them present data and they would do the data that would have 7,308 people. And I can remember thinking, I know cancer has large sound. Where do you get those? They're not here. Well, no, they're from the NCI, the National Cancer Institute Network. And that, now you have 20 years ago the rationale for why I essentially at some point in my life started the National Network of Depression Centers because I realized we're never going to come up with steps that cancer has made advances in or heart disease or now even Alzheimer's without having those things. Network, large databases, longitudinal monitoring. So we'll come back to that. And next week as you listen to Josh Gordon um, talk about that term, you'll sort of see that when we do that, then we'll probably have some perspectives about putting some things together. It will guide us to what our best treatments are. Okay, so I'm going to go through those moderately fast. Let's look at them a little bit and then do some clinical anecdoting, and I'll try to do that. But screening and monitoring everyone. Whenever I say that, oh, come on, you don't need to screen everyone. I don't know how many in this room, if we pretend that all of you had depression, have ever had a depression screen, unless you've done it yourself. It's probably uncommon. But if one in six of us have this, there are people in this room who have had clinical depressions. But we don't screen, and we should. And, uh, and secondly, uh, they ought to be standardized. This set of batteries that's up here, PHQ-9, Generalized Anxiety Disorder 7, the CSSRS, a suicide scale, an Altman Mania scale, and then sleep measures. And those vary a little bit. Are, are now standard scales that we're using in the NNDC, but they basically are essentially very simple. You say this to psychiatrists, and I was once somebody who lived with the Hamilton and, uh, and others with its whole battery. PHQ-9, it's a garbage scale but it's being used by pediatricians, by college, mental health, by everybody else. And it's time for us to talk the same language. And now we've got companies that are doing it and they're all sort of moving in, sometimes their own things, but we need to kind of adapt and we should be doing it across the boundary. If you have addictions and alcohol problems, if you have eating disorders, if you have autism, I've got an article out there, autism and depression. You know, I think these exist together. So we should probably at some point in time 
have primary care doctors screening everybody. Okay, why youth? Why would you screen kids? They don't have problems, do they? Well, the age of onset for clinical depression, one of the least known facts, <laughs> because we associate it with people who are old, 15 to 24 is the peak age of onset for depression and bipolar, 15 to 24. That's when it kind of takes off. And if we don't go after that group, then we're missing all of the earlier years when we could intervene effectively. And so to do it, point one, I think well taken. Screen. Well, wait a minute. Screen everybody? What about women? They're doing fine. <laughs> They're cruising through life. What about postpartum issues, just maybe as a routine? I'm just tossing out a couple to say screening could and should be repeated. You could find somebody who didn't have any problems when they were in high school or in college, and now they have a baby. What about postpartum risk? Detection rates for postpartum depression with screening are six times higher than without. So you're finding 6.3% when they say, you know, I can't function, and I'm just, I'm, you know, I can't sleep, I'm tearful, I worry that I'm going to do something bad with my baby, uh, on and on. And that's the 6.3. Some of those people can be found earlier and treated before bad things do happen. Screen. Okay. We're not alone anymore on this. Why recommend screening? Well, now it's put forth by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. It's the standard of care. Again, we're not, we, it takes a while for all of us in healthcare to adopt. But this one puzzled me, and I'm showing you the old version. They since adapted this language. So it's an update of the 2009 when they just recommended screening for depression and certain adults and this kind of stuff. Now they're saying 18 years and older. Then they went back and said, well, we really mean adolescents too. And so um, this is now a recommendation that's out there, and we should probably be picking up on it. Okay, now the piece, I've already shown it to you with that little diagram. You end up having Amazon, Google, Alphabet, Verily, uh, IBM, Apple, who else? <laughs> All have developed their own little tools to help us, if you will, do some monitoring. And that's not just an approach to screening, it's an approach to longitudinal assessments. So if we do it, this is maybe what we'll find. Because you're carrying your monitor in your pocket right now. These are, by the way, the biomarkers of the future. Now, I don't know as of yesterday, I just saw the price tag as I was traveling, and it's $999, you can get the Apple uh, 10, uh, whatever it's called, the, uh, whatever their name, it's got an X, but it's iPhone 10, iPhone 10. And, um, and so uh, it is out there for that price tag. I don't know whether it, some had said it was likely to have some tool to enable you to monitor sleep, take it to bed with you and stuff. And um, whatever it is, they're there now. You can actually find them. They're not that good, and what troubles me a great deal, you already heard me say, I guess I didn't emphasize it very much, we should start talking the same language as primary care doctors, as obstetricians, as, you know, on and on. And that means using the same scales. Well, all of a sudden, here we have our IT world taking off, and everybody's developing their own. And they probably won't talk with each other, so then we'll have to have a challenge. So next week, ask Josh Gordon, how are you going to handle it with machine learning the fact that you may have to look at a population and they have longitudinal monitoring done by four different companies <laughs> or something, and they're all saying that they're looking at REM sleep or something, whatever. Uh, I don't know. But uh, Okay, so now I'm going to use you as a group of participants. I hate to, at the end, we can cure you all, or, some, or at least make you better. But right now, all of you have depression. What would we like done with us? And you know, how would we want to be treated? And I'm sure that there are some people in this auditorium who have been treated and gone through that. Well, 
I've already said it in the little list, and I'm just backing up. I would hope that my clinician, if I had depression, would search and treat for all of the things, consider all of those things that might affect me. I don't have it yet. At least I monitor and I pay attention to it. My mother, my uncle, my grandmother, and now most recently my older brother all have diabetes. Do I watch it? You bet. <laughs> you know, if I got it, would it make me have a mood disorder in a late life? I don't know. I hope not, but it could. And so then you start actually facing, do I want to know if somebody doesn't take some of that quick history, then we have a little bit of a problem. Um, and so let's look at some of those. Back to that list. So we'll pick out just a couple. I'm only talking about any of the ones on the left side because too many topic areas. We can talk about head trauma, soccer, and football, and uh, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but in high schools around the country, there's actually a little bit of a, we're watching something that is a public health response. Um, high schools are starting to not have adequate candidates go out for their football team in some areas of the country because of the concern about head injury. Started with PTOs and moms getting upset, and next thing you know, we're watching something. I, I'm an athletic fan, but I'm not so sure that's a bad idea. You know, and uh, and uh, we've got to think about what are the consequences of these things. So we'll look at some of this left side and just pick up on them. But first, an axiom: co-occurrences are the norm not the exception. So if you go back to that list, what do you do if you have sleep apnea and the traditional, if you will, neurotransmitter, genetically mediated, uh, serotonergically based clinical depression, and throw in diabetes uh, too or something? What do you do? Well, treat them all, you know, in the best way that you know how. Because co-occurrences are the norm and not the exception. So I'm going to give you a few illustrations of these. And one of them, so I would like to believe, my, the only stuff that I've done for probably the past decade predominantly in my clinical work has been TRD. I migrated into treatment-resistant depression, getting the referrals. And so I've paid attention to what's happening with you know, some of these. So, and I would have told you, oh, I do that routinely. But I'm going to give you an anecdote about that first one. So first, sleep apnea. 25% prevalence in our society. Nobody knows that. I didn't until I looked it up some time ago, a couple years ago. And it goes up perhaps as high as 50% if you're male, old, obese, and drinking. 50%. So now if all of you, you're not, this is a young audience, but if you are uh, all this population with depression and you're male and above 50, how many times do we actually do a screen for sleep apnea? And uh, can we say we're migrating toward personalized treatment if we, if we don't? And three quarters of those with obstructive sleep apnea, when looked at with the screening that we do clinically and plugged into DSM have a depressive phenotype, three quarters. So do the math on three quarters of over 50%. Now, how many males 55 years old who have depression, if they go in at all because of stigma, really have that assessment taken? Not very many. And the clues, we all know them. The snorting, gasping, stopping breathing, etc. cetera. Um, while the sleep... There are actually stop baying is a scale that's been a snore, tired, observed, and your blood pressure is high, and then the physiological things. But the histories are so revealing, you don't need a scale on that one. If you start asking the questions, has anybody ever told you? And so um, there are tests. Those are the biomarkers. This is an area where we have biomarkers if somebody wants to go in and do them. But we don't use it too often. And... Uh, we have treatments that work. So if you use the CPAP, and most of those who have depressive phenotype who adhere to the CPAP, the depression goes away if they started 
in old age, you know, 50, 55, 60. So some of late onset depression has now got some clues for personalized precise treatments, but we don't use that one enough. And so I would have, let me back up. So I'm truth in advertising that I just told you, oh gosh, I do that routinely. And some of what I'm saying, I wish I did all of the time, but I'll um, just give you a little anecdote. I told this to one of the groups that I met with this morning, and uh, it was last, no, it was this morning, and I had a patient evaluation referral from Ohio for treatment-resistant depression, and uh, she was 69 years old, and she basically was being sent up because she knew somebody in the Ohio uh, network who was a Michigan grad, and they said, you ought to go up and go to the Michigan Depression Center. So they did, and I saw this person, and uh, the story came with a nice summary from the doctor. And the story was that she had stir started to have depression in late 20s, following birth of a baby, and uh, sometimes that's a clue to bipolar subsequently. I, I don't think it was here. But ended up having a terrific response to uh, basically to an SSRI and um, stayed with it for probably about 15 years and did very well. And then whatever I have you at the age, I'm getting close, uh, she started having difficulties and they adjusted doses and uh, the difficulties kind of persisted and then steadily got worse. And then she had gotten to the point where she was suicidal. Her doctor tried to do some switching. She always seemingly did better when she was on the Paxil, which was the brand name, and, um, and was reluctant and hesitant to leave it. It always helped me so much in the past. And can't I just stay with that? And then she ended up getting to the point where she literally was, um, I don't want to go on living. And her husband died. And then um, now things even really got worse. And so friends were getting concerned, and it was not too long after that that the referral came. And I went through everything that I'm talking about, and I thought, okay, this is good. And where I was in my head, no list. You know, I know that list, right? <laughs> I don't. You know, that thing that I'm throwing up. I'd like to believe I did, but I didn't. And, um, and so I was talking to myself about, okay, ketamine is maybe uh, indicated right now. She hasn't had it. Let's think about a ketamine infusion. And, um, and then uh, uh, somewhere in the middle of the history, we were discussing time and what she would have, and she ended up saying, um, well, my friend drove me up here, and... Uh, and I basically, you know, I was afraid to drive. I was afraid, actually, that I would see some concrete abutment and drive into it and stuff. And um, this morning, I just have to tell you, she, would, I mean, she was wasting time, I think, on this. And she said, I asked my friend, how are you doing? And uh, she said, how am I doing? I'm doing terrible. I'm glad I'm here with you, but I didn't sleep a wink last night. Uh, she said, we had shared a room in the hotel to save money. And she said, she, she said, are you aware of how loud you snore and how terrible your sleep is? And, um, and she said, you know, there were times that I, I find myself waking up wondering whether you have died in the bed. And, uh, and then all of a sudden you make noises and you start up again, but then you just instantly start snoring again. I did not sleep almost at all all last night, and I didn't want to wake you because I knew you had this appointment today. You probably don't even remember when the guy next door in the hotel, was in the motel, was pounding on the wall trying to get you to, you know, to wake up, to do whatever. Now you know who I am. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> you know, something like this. And uh, so she's telling me this, and she didn't come with a diagnosis. And I'm saying, oh, my God, I haven't asked a thing about her sleep pattern and sleep apnea. And I said, oh, gosh. <laughs> you know, I didn't tell her that I was thinking ketamine. And I said, we need to get you evaluated in a sleep lab. 
Well, they even stopped her process after about two hours in the sleep lab, and they said uh, she has some of the worst sleep apnea that we've seen. And uh, so I followed her. I was just going to do an evaluation. Nothing else. We kept the medication going. Sleep apnea procedure was done. She's doing well. This is two and a half years ago now. And so all of the things, the medication probably was needed. You know, she had that history before. She didn't have sleep apnea when she was in her 20s. Um, she swears to it, and she said her husband never said anything. But uh, we've got to sort of have some guidance when we do these things, and it's an approach that's there. This now is new. How many people have followed this story? Because it's a little controversial. We have inflammatory depression. Andy Miller came out with this term. This Well, the term was older. But in biological psychiatry, a cover article, 2012, this was actually on the cover. Um, he ended up having uh, this thing about inflammatory depression. Well, where do you get it? Well, you get it by, it's not necessarily that somebody's been banging your head. It's cytokines, and it's uh, inflammatory, you know, the IL-6, IL-1, IL-6, uh, TNF, uh, the whole thing that at this stage in time, the diagram was very revealing, and I have used it as a teaching thing. So if you have stuff that's happening, stress can do some of it. And all of this stuff that when I was doing two decades of stuff looking at CRH and adrenal gland, I never had that in my head at all. It was just not there. Paying no attention whatsoever to the immune system and macrophages and this kind of stuff. The cortisol story was all we did. If you end up having uh, these things, what's the likelihood? And I was a skeptic, but I've been following this story now for five, six, seven years, eight years, and I'm now a very profound believer. And you actually are, next, you've got a couple of people in the room here that I'm seeing who are working in this arena and looking at some of it with regard to treatment-resistant depression. And the people at Mayo have uh, Sutai has actually been doing it in animal work. And let's look at it. So first, go through this real fast. And I'm not going to do anything about this other than talk about how people have been making these diagrams. My God, if we would expect our residents to kind of keep track of that, or medical students, forget it. But what we can say is that inflammatory cytokines go into our brain. And when they're there, they interact with neurotransmitter metabolism, neuroendocrine, neuroplasticity, glutamate release, which is maybe one of the targets that we're going to find predicts ketamine response and oxidative stress and loss of glia. And so if you put all of that together, how might the clinician tell what's there and what you end up having? And there aren't any clues that I was able to come up with. That phenotype looks pretty much the same, except for this stuff that's been coming out of some of the studies, uh, the role of inflammation and suicide. I guess it's lost underneath there, but suicidal patients. And lo and behold, Early evidence, but IL-1 and IL-6, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, if they're elevated, there's greater risk for suicidal ideation and even attempts. And is that something we should be looking at? And the answer, I think, is probably yes. So now, I haven't done it routinely. That's truth in advertising honesty now. Uh, I'm, but I am now anybody with a TRD, a treatment-resistant depression, I've met, I, and I've been trying to get us to do it at Michigan. We're not yet. Nobody, it, it's hard to change culture. But I've been routinely assessing now interleukin-1, interleukin-6, TNF, and CRP. And CRP, it turns out, is the one that probably is the one that we maybe need to pay most attention to. But back up. So if we're now into this framework, so now we have TRD, and... You can have depression phenotype. You can have suicidal ideation. I'm sick. That's what they often, I just don't feel good physically and that kind of stuff because of that profile that they get from the inflammatory markers. And this is the profile of coexisting conditions. And then if you start looking at that one, 
lo and behold, now there are reports, so we talked about this last night at dinner, if you end up having an elevation, this whole group is depressed again. And over here, you all have bipolar and depression. Over here, you have no elevated um, CRP. You have depression, but an elevated CRP. You all get put on escitalopram, conventional treatment. After four weeks, which side was which? <laughs> you have not. You are already doing statistically better. After eight weeks, you're doing statistically better to the point of 0 .008. You know, so it's uh, and the one difference is they have elevated CRP. Now they also probably have other things that are there. Is it going to be that good? I doubt it. You know, across the board, though, are you going to conventionally be able to say nothing is that perfect? But when you have something that's starting to jump out, and there are now a variety of reports that are out there on this, should we be doing it for everybody with treatment-resistant depression? I think so. And then I think it's a question of, well, but that's just with escitalopram. It's just saying those who don't have the inflammatory. What do we do with you guys over here who did have the elevation? So in a subsequent study... That group was treated with Celebrex and conventional medications. And the group with Celebrex did better than the group without. And there now are about four reports that I'm aware of that are like that, and maybe more. I haven't made this my major theme. But uh, I think we need replications. And there actually are... You know, some people now who have gotten into the several thousand individuals looking at some of this. So it's probably something we can do. Sophia picked up on what she would like to do um, in the state of Minnesota, apparently, uh, often a leader in a variety of things, has sort of said, we'd like to really have something that makes addictions um, a major focus for us. And I think Let's quickly look, and I'm bringing Coles to Newcastle, I sense, on this one. But look at, first, the more pain you have, the more depression you have. So right away it gets confounded. That's probably inflammatory now that I think about it. I didn't in the old days, but now it's probably because you have inflammation with arthritis. You've probably got the same things going on in the brain. If you have stuff affecting your heart, probably the same thing up there. Um, so in context of... This, we now end up having, if you have, these are the people in the old days, people used to say, oh my, we wrote books about the, the big chart, you know, the, the gomers and bad, bad terms. Um, and I think they were the ones who had multiple, multiple physical complaints. And it turns out many of them, most of them have depression. So that's the first point. The second point is, what are we doing now with treating these? We're treating them way too often with opioids. And so then you have the data that are coming out of multiple things, including military. And the longer use that you are on an opioid, the longer time period, and the higher the dosage, the more likely you also develop diagnosis of depression. Now we're into, again, precision things. Oh, gee, you have depressive phenotype. Could it be that it's that medication that you're taking? And we attribute that to some things, but I never knew that to the degree of where they are. These are military data. Oops, sorry. Uh, 90 days that you've been on an opioid, 25% more likely depressed. 180 days or longer, 53% more likely. And now the conclusions are coming out from some of the soldiers uh, that have been on these a lot that suicide rates in the spike that maybe was occurring in the military population. Some of it was attributed to this. And this is one of the more scary. Minnesota, by the way, I looked at the, well, here it is. You're in better shape than lots, including Michigan, for example. But those are, you know, painkiller prescriptions. There were more prescriptions for opioids last year in Michigan than there are people. Uh, think about that. <laughs> And um, so right away, we're not doing a very good job. But these are drug overdose deaths. And 
59 to 65,000 people died from all drug overdoses. 42,000 of those were from opioids. 42,000 people last year. And so I'm going to, you know, car crashes. You can look at HIV, worst gun deaths. I mean, we're swamping it right now. We have an epidemic, and everybody knows this, but we're not taking it seriously enough. And if you are starting to do it, this should be a high priority for you. And so Dr. Vinogradov is on right target. Uh, so we ought to be asking about this for everybody who is depressed, especially if they have pain. Has anyone given you... Uh, medications? If so, what kind? Well, yeah, I'm taking something. I just take stuff over the counter. You ask them, what about oxycodone, oxycontin, uh, fentanyl, you know, in some cases, and you hear it. And then what we really ought to be doing is being extreme. And uh, this creates problems, and I'm going to give you an anecdote, but if they, excuse the typo, but if they are given a prescription, it probably should be five and then told to come back if they need more. And that's five, you know. So uh, now I'm going to move into a different story, potential buyer marker, but uh, uh, I'm going to give you a point that's controversial. I think it's time for us to be using more of these. They're by no means perfect. They're by no means magical. The ones that I've been involved with testing, David Morazic at Mayo before he died, uh, started all of this, and this is called, I'm not an advocate, even though we've done, I've been part of, of a large-scale grant, uh, no money that I've gotten, uh, but it's a uh, gene site. So I'm going to show you something. First, this is the distribution that goes back. This bothers me whenever I see things like this. 1992, the cancer people were looking at cytochrome P450 2D6 distributions and how you had where you got categorized. 1992, these were, this is log scales, but these were ultra rapid metabolizers. These were poor metabolizers. And most of them were, they gave them names. They still stick. But if you're an ultra rapid metabolizer, so this group over here, you chew these meds up like crazy if you're metabolized by cytochrome P450 2D6. You can have the same things, by the way. They've been done with other enzymes in the liver. This group over here will pretend you're the slow metabolizers. Same dose of something with 2D6, and you start getting side effects. This group over here, these damn medicines don't help. You know, I don't feel a thing. <laughs> and so with that as a starting point, do we have precision treatment just by using the same approach for those two groups? You know, they're gonna, sorry, they're gonna do the same thing. I'm sorry, where did it go? No, the answer is bluntly no. It's just not gonna be, does that mean the medication's no good? Does that mean that sometimes it's not a failure if you have a population that's actually entering a randomized control trial and they happen to have a disproportionate number? It's time for us to start thinking of all of this. So if they say, I can't tolerate these medicines, doc, first thing you ought to think about is slow metabolizer. You know, we don't. Um, and next one, I don't feel a thing, ultra rapid metabolizer. They once worked, but they've stopped working, so now I just have side effects. Well, maybe not quite a really slow metabolizer, but somebody who over four, three, four months is accumulating. And uh, so now I'm going to show you some. So here's a, a comparison of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Those are the more accurate terms. People use pharmacodynamics, pharmacogenetics, but that's pushing it at this stage. We're not really, we're into measuring metabolism and distribution. So this is a person who is a white male and uh, ends up having, it's a, for those of you who know antidepressant medication, it's a pretty bizarre list that this person can tolerate. You know, we're into Europe, we're into patches, and uh, we've got a couple traditional meds that might be usable. But this scale saying, uh, this is not so good in the framework of if you're going to use a conventional battery, well, an awful lot of them over here. And then the scale, number one says the serum level may be too high. Lower doses may be required. 
And at that point in time, I do these routinely on treatment-resistant depression. I looked at, and I'm pretty good at now, kind of knowing what are the patterns. And when you see certain medicines over here, I sort of looked at this and I said, oh my God, this person has a 2D6 system that's pretty screwed up. And uh, then I'm gonna so show you a comparison of somebody else. So think of that in your head. This is that same person. And I looked, there's no, no cytochrome P450, one of the major alleles, none in that person. And yet, am I going to give a medication that's metabolized by 2D6? And uh, this one is also reduced. So in the two, two of the major pathways, not so good. Now, this is somebody else. That person has bupropion. All of these are pretty good. And, you know, these other ones, serum level may be too high. You're supposed to just know and look because some of them are on different pathways as well. But very different. Now, I know these two people pretty well. Uh, that person, by the way, is an extensive metabolizer for 2D6. Okay, so the first one is me. I did my own. I've never had an antidepressant, but I did my own. I wanted to know. I talk about these things. What am I? And so the second one happens to be my wife, <laughs> because I was just looking for somebody else. who She's never been on an antidepressant. <laughs> so um, I did Renee. So she's over here. <laughs> and and I, when I gave this talk about a year and a half ago or something to the Michigan Psychiatric Society, that's when I got these. One of the hands went up in the audience, and the, this guy said, what the hell do your kids look like? <laughs> So, I don't know. We haven't done them. But uh, uh, what I do know is that you got two people who don't have TRD and have never been treated for depression. But boy, would they like to know what that pattern would be like before the pattern that we sometimes get into. Of, well, let's try this. Well, that didn't work. Let's try this. Well, that didn't work. Let's try this. And that's starting to get to personalized, precise medicine. It's starting. It doesn't put us there yet, but it's beginning. And so do these things, do pharmacogenomic, if you will, antidepressant biomarkers. Tell us what you have. They don't screen. They don't diagnose. No. Do they select the most effective treatment? No. That list does not tell you what's going to work. It tells you what they can't tolerate. Does it assess severity? No. Longitudinal monitoring? No. Identify causes? No. It's pretty worthless. And that sometimes is what I hear from psychiatrists. It doesn't tell me what to pick. It doesn't. But it tells me what not to. There's my thing. And that's pretty important. And can a judge dosage? And then, at some point, does that actually potentially guide me if I'm fortunate enough to choose the medication that may work for an underlying serotonergic depression abnormality? I think so. You know, it's all good. Now, we're compiling a bunch of stuff, so this is just a um, full disclosure type of stuff. We're evaluating uh, Sagar Parika, a colleague of mine at Michigan, are working with AssureX, um, and pulling together several thousand of people from a national sample. And in November, we'll break a code, and it'll be something that uh, it'll get shared. I don't know that it'll hold up in a large sample, but we'll find out. But I am already at a point where I'll give you my bias, and that's mostly from TRD. I think the time may have come to measure pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic patterns for everybody with the treatment-resistant depression. Because I think it may be the type of stuff that can be life-saving. And two, the time may come in the future, and we don't have data for that yet, when we'll be able to tell with economic data rather than it shortens the course of treatment. You don't guess, oh, let's switch, let's do that. Oh, another switch, let's do this. Um, and in all of that stuff, that we start doing it for everybody. The data are not there yet that one can say, oh, very clearly, this is what we should do now. But I think time will come. What's another thing for precision treatment? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. 
And if somebody gets better with the treatment and you stop that treatment, you're not doing what would be data supported for personalized, precise treatment. These are data that are so old. It's also scary. I don't know where they are. <laughs> Where's the reference? Fell off of this one. It's actually from about 2004 with uh, John Geddes and David Kupfer, various people, and they pulled together a meta-analysis. And if all of the people in this room are given a different antidepressant, noradrenergic reuptake, MAOI, tricyclic, and SSRI, but if you all get better and then you're taken off versus kept on, what's the difference? doesn't make any difference what got you there. If you've gotten better with that and you have kept on it and you start looking at where are you afterwards, uh, basically the evidence comes out overwhelmingly that if you stay on it, that indefinite recurrence prevention is effective and indicated for anybody who is at risk for TRD. Something gets them better, don't go off it. And that's... Uh, you know, because if you look at the next steps, and there are, there are more diagrams in this thing, but the 70%, where is it? You know, you're in five digits or something like that in terms of the statistical analysis. Um, why would we take people off when we know we can keep them better when the odds of a relapse then are uh, 18 months or 30, 40, 50%? So... Let's close by talking about something. This is actually our diagram from our depression center. I've been hearing all kinds of things from people in this room, meeting with them about stuff where, how do you go after this stuff? Basic science, biomarkers, personalized precise treatments. These are trials. So, you know, we want to know what are the causes. Well, we don't have biomarkers yet for everything, but we're already trying to talk about some things. So, uh, a pharmacokinetic marker is a biomarker. A uh, sleep apnea a biomarker. We have some. We just have to use them. And then at some point, uh, what do we do with various populations? That all looks good. Uh, that's the stuff we've been trying to talk about. This is what we're putting into, you know, biomarkers, partnerships, common language, registries, long-term, large samples. Ultimately, you come up with something that theoretically works. Well, oh, if only it were so simple, because how do you get there? And this goes now back to what I talked about with Sophia last night and, and with others, um, because you only get there probably by working at the infrastructure to get us there, and we haven't had it. So uh, in 2008, we launched the National Network of Depression Centers, and there were 16 of us that got together um, and um, talked about, why don't we share data? Why don't we start doing a standardized assessment? Why don't we use the same scales? Why don't we start collecting it and creating a registry and looking at people over years? And so now there are 25 of us in the United States. There are six collaborating ones, seven, sorry, in Canada, one in Germany. It's a good idea, and it's actually starting to happen, but boy, is it hard work. And uh, that's, you know, if only it looks so simple. So we're moving now to where we have, our goal is to have an enrollment of 25,000 where we have a registry that we can go back and look. Oh, let's look at all of the people who in uh, our evaluations ended up having uh, inflammatory markers if that happened to be done. And how do they do years later? <laughs> I'm making that up as I do this. But it took forever. We went over 2,000 in the registry um, in the end of 2016. This year, we'll probably have 5,000. This is actually the group, for any of you who are curious. And uh, these are the groups right now over here that have already been collecting data. And some are just starting, have just gotten ready. And this is from September. And there are some that are agreements or they're IRBs. My God, it's agonizing. And uh, 
I told Sophia I was going to do this, but she didn't know specifically. I'm actually hoping that we could think about, <laughs> you know, what could we do to uh, think about how um, one more place could join. And, uh, and if so, then what we're really talking about is more participation and computational approaches and machine learning. What else can we do? And this is your speaker for next week or when? Next month. Okay. Uh, and these are the strategies. Think about where we'll be in the future. I won't be here, you know, but some of you are going to be here doing it and leading it. We're going to have partnerships with not just there, but today I was meeting with the postdocs with the uh, leaders of Minnesota's industry. You know, you've got biomedical uh, strengths here. And at this stage in time, it doesn't have to be Google and Apple, uh, barely. It can be even here. Look for partners. Pluripotent stem cells, these are the diagrams. You know, I don't. How, anybody here doing stem cell stuff? It's not hard, and it takes money, but I uh, had a project going, Melvin McInnes has had a project going with bipolar. Take a skin sample from the buttocks. Why? Because the sun doesn't get there. <laughs> and uh, and put it into a dish, and pretty soon you're really excited, right? You have skin cells growing. What a big accomplishment. Well, the Japanese scientists, and I won't get the names right, so I won't try, ended up a couple years ago five years ago, winning Nobel Prizes for uh, figuring out how you can take various chemical steps and move those skin cells back to pluripotent stem cells. So now you can convert them backwards. That's been the reverse. They didn't do that, but that's been done in a variety of places. And you can convert them into muscle and bone and cardiac. And uh, we've done it into neurons. And so you can now say, well, we don't have a skin cells growing in a dish, we have neurons growing in a dish. Well, if they happen to be all people have bipolar illness and you don't, that's match controls, we can start how do your skin cells in this dish respond to lithium versus, you know, a normal calcium efflux pattern or something, and or to lamotrigine or to, you know, ketamine or to whatever. And these are actually strategies that can be done. That's starting to get to real personalized precision treatment. Um, we need response markers ahead of time. We don't know, we talked last night at dinner, we don't know who's likely to respond to ketamine and who's not. So it's just one more in our list of, well, let's try this. And it should be possible with just a simple study we're trying, we're doing it now as part of the NNDC to um, sit back and say, We'll compare responders versus non-responders and go back afterwards and look at what's the collection of the things that show up. Is it going to be inflammatory? Is it going to be, you know, whatever. You can read these, the rest of these things. But we're going to have selections of psychotherapy. We'll have clues if we really do this stuff. And, you know, machine learning is going to be part of our profile. It's not something that's taking away from us. It's giving us tools. It's actually something that's adding to our portfolio. And the time will come when we can use basically automated CBT, but it'll be guided by us. And, uh, and I think it's something we should do now. This is the ketamine thing that I mentioned last night at dinner. <laughs> and uh, it's called the anti-antidepressant. Did you find it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but this is, a, this is a controversy in the sense that the group is saying when we're going into innovation and ketamine is either schlocky stuff and it's inappropriately used and it's uncontrolled or it's one of the best things that happened. And uh, this group wrote an article that basically said there's a clearly identified need. We, oops, sorry. We can balance safety and, uh, and efficacy we can really show you some robust evidence. Um, we can continue to look at these things. You can read them. But in essence, we should go forward. That's where I'm at with ketamine. We ought to be doing it. We ought to be evaluating it. We ought to be looking at it. But we should not be opening clinics like some of the ones in New Jersey were, which is ketamine clinic for depression.
because uh, your first ketamine infusion is free if it works, $1,000 for each subsequent one. You know, and that's not where we need to go. But we are now uh, closing in on a point at Michigan. We have not had a ketamine clinic. Yale has some, there are a variety of other places, but we're about to think about it. And I would encourage you to actually make it part of your, of your uh, depression, mood disorders, bipolar uh, portfolio. So uh, bold targets, and we'll close and discuss. Um, we ought to be reducing the suicide rate 20% by 2025. <laughs> so I'm not going to take credit, but I was president of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and we were having a retreat, and it was to create an agenda. And I kept saying, let's set a goal. And that was in 2012, 2013 maybe. And I, my goal was, let's reduce suicide rate 20% by 2020. I was into marketing. 20% by 2020. People said, well, we haven't been able to reduce that rate. What happens if we fail? People will stop giving money. And I said, no, we just say this, chan this problem is difficult. We need more help. We need more assistance. We need more grants. Uh, let's, let's set a goal and use it as a target. It took us a while, but ultimately, five years later, came out 20% by 2025. Now, that's actually a very commendable goal. We need it. Um, we ought to be reducing the rates of treatment-resistant depression from 30%. If we did it right, 15%. We ought to be talking, in our, my world, a registry of 10,000 by 2020. Five-year wellness. I don't know about you, but I'm very sick of hearing studies that are four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks. <laughs> Cancer talks five-year survival, and then they got there and they moved on to 10-year survival. Our goal ought to be to keep people better. Five years, let's start there. We'll worry about 10 subsequently. At least five well-documented biomarkers. 2020, that's not on there. Oops, what did I just do? Uh, and then routine maintenance treatments to maintain wellness. And if we did some of those things, they're not all personalized, precise treatments, but they are really clues to get people better. And eventually we ought to be looking at this as one that people could do, these things that are out there. Nobody's doing them as far as I know. Few people are, but measuring, for example, BDNF in response to exercise. Exercise works for some people. It's a major, major boost for getting better. Could we tell? Maybe. There's all kinds of data out there now, and by the way, I'm just tossing these out, not because I'm an expert, but there are data out there that show that Botox can be used with some people, and it helps depression. <laughs> Why? I don't know, but the data are somehow fairly dramatic. Rexanolone for severe postpartum depression. Uh, these get into the whole thing of trying to target what is it that has a big depletion that produces these things. These are the things that I read about and I think, I don't know of anybody who's doing those things on a large scale stuff. So if somebody wants to jump in on some things, it's all yours. So the hope would be that if we do that, we can fill out that last box, just in some ways with two, three, four, five things that are, that are more uh, tailored, precise, personalized, and evidence-based. And so with that, Minnesota, really is pivotal in trying to think about this, and uh, let's do it. And so, thank you. And I have no idea what time it is. You now we got a little time. We have time for some questions in seconds, and questions from the audience. Oh, I was told about that, but... <laughs> Ooh. My question has to do with adolescence. Since many depressions begin in adolescence or and even childhood, what caveats might you have in the paradigm you presented us in regards to adolescent depression? <laughs> One, screen. <laughs> you know, we should be screening everybody in schools. And uh, we aren't yet. And I said that multiple times. Two is if it's there, then what? Uh, <laughs> um, so 
Well, first, I'll see if I can answer it with content items. Three is the evidence, eh, not so great, you know, as I read it and stuff. Not control, but everybody who looks at these things comes up with some conclusion that the earlier that you intervene, the better the results. And so if you treat early, if it's there, uh, it doesn't say what you're treating with. It could be psychotherapy, it could be whatever. But if you treat earlier, then they get better. Then the fourth goal is you got to keep them better because depressions and bipolar illnesses are episodic recurrent disorders. And so with that, um, how much, what time is it? I'm going to tell it. Okay, but I mean, is, uh, do I have oh, got... two minutes for a story? Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a group yeah, that's part of our depression center in Michigan that is uh, called the Community Volunteers Group. Started off with about 12 women who decided they wanted to do something to have community outreach and to help the depression center. It's now about 75, and every year it has a party, and people get together. And, and uh, two years ago, one of my friends ended up saying, John, you need to talk with, mentioned a name. Uh, and, um, and I said, why? Well, she told me a story about her children, and I asked her, would you be willing to ever tell this story to a group? What group? So she told her, the Depression Center party. So the story was, uh, she did. And she got up, a little anxious, and there were 200 people there at this party. Uh, and, uh, and she said, I had two ch have two children, two boys. At the time, they were 16 and 14. And... The 16 year old was cruising through life and, you know, having fun, friends, girlfriend, etc. 14 year old, good kid, decent grades, but he was starting to slip and have trouble. And he uh, ended up actually being of concern to us, my husband and I. And he wasn't sleeping, we would hear him. He seemingly had lost a little weight. Uh, he, his grades were dropping a little bit. Um, he was irritable. He was doing stuff that just wasn't good. And when we'd ask him, he'd bolt from the room a little bit. We didn't push it. And then one night, my 16-year-old said something, and he picked up a piece of silverware and threw it across the table and bolted from the table in tears and said, just get away from me. Leave me alone. I can't stand any of you. I don't want to go on living. You know, and, uh, and went into the basement, and, you know, we all looked at each other and got very concerned and followed him and went downstairs, and, you know, and she's doing this, honey, honey, what's wrong? And, uh, and um, you know, he just kept repeating, get away from me. I, I can't stand it. Just leave me alone. And 16-year-old, uh, and at some point, as we're trying to do this, looked at him and said, dude, you got depression. And, uh, and my husband and I turned and looked at him, and he said, you got depression. He said, this is the age that it starts. You're in it. You've got symptoms that are just classic. You don't sleep. You've lost weight. Your appetite is bad. You essentially stopped having fun. You stopped your sports team. You don't hang around with anybody anymore. You keep me awake at 3 in the morning, you know, walking around upstairs, and uh, you got depression. Now, this is an illness, and it's treatable, and we need to go get you some help, and I will go with you to do it. And uh, Mom, who was telling us, even a trace tearful, and she said, you know, we're supposed to be down there for the 14-year-old, and I, she said, I was the one who, looking at my 16-year-old, and my husband said to him, where did you learn all of this? And he said, well, the University of Michigan Depression Center has a program with our schools. And they come and they meet with the principal and then the counselors and the teachers. And we do projects. My project was to describe clinical depression at the age of onset. And, uh, dude, you got it. Let's go do it. And, uh, and she said, we did. And he went along with me and uh, with us. Well, my 16-year-old is now 18. He's in college a good year uh, already as freshman. He completed it. And, uh, 
And my uh, then 14-year-old is now 16, and he's getting ready to go to college. He's being treated. He's on a medication. He's doing okay, and he's uh, actually doing quite well. Now, um, she said a couple things. I'm not quite sure why Dr. Graydon asked me to give this comment, but two things struck us as really important. One, would our son have listened to us if we were the voices instead of his brother? And two, uh, at this stage, why did we wait so long? You know, so one of them was stigma, the last one. The first one uh, gets to the peer-to-peer -peer story. And, uh, and she said, and it's especially relevant to say, why did we wait so long? My husband is here. He's in the front row. And uh, he raised his hand and he said, I asked him if you, this would be okay. He said, it's fine. It's part of the story. He's a psychiatrist. <laughs> and so, you know, bottom line is, as I've called that story, dude, you got depression. It prompted us to get into what we call peer-to-peer -peer stuff. And back to this, peer uh, involvement is really, really important in the military, on sports teams, in adolescence, in school. They listen to each other. And that's when it's bad stuff like on on uh, Facebook and stuff like this, uh, Instagram, it can be destructive. When it's good stuff, it can be remarkably therapeutic. And um, so um, in addition to everything else that goes on in conventional treatment, we should be mobilizing peers, David. <laughs> so um, additional questions. Other questions? That one took a long time. <laughs> Go ahead. As you can tell, I like to tell stories. Uh, Dr. Graydon, I heard you um, give a grand rounds about 25 or 30 years ago, and you gave a rubric about uh, maintaining lifelong antidepressant treatment. Yep. Uh, for any episode over 50 years. Three over, strikes and you're on. Three strikes and you're on, any yeah. three episodes. Um, any, and I've used that a lot over, this, over the 30 years, anything different about that advice now? No, yeah, other than the fact that it's amazing how long you saw the data that came from, I think, the study that I had up there that didn't have the data on it, the stuff from John Geddes and Dave Kupfer and stuff, and that's a meta-analysis from any antidepressant, and if you go off it, um, odds are you're likely to have. That didn't address the time period. The estimates are that if you have three episodes and you go off of your antidepressants, um, I think the figure that's been out there, small samples, were 70% likelihood that you'll have another episode by 18 months. You know, and so uh, should we be maintaining when we have people who have multiple episodes and we get them better? Should we be, yes. Should we be maintaining when we give them a medicine and they don't get better? <laughs> not at all. You know, probably not. So, so the follow-up question is, Given the widespread, much wider spread use of antidepressants now than then, why haven't we seen improvements in the suicide rate, the prevalence of depression, the rates of hospitalization, I think, have gone down for economic reasons more than for clinical reasons? Well, you're asking such a powerful question, and I would love it if all of you would join in. I don't know that we have time, but I do know that the answer was what I was trying to give ahead of time. I don't think the array of growing antidepressants, we have more than 40 of them now. Um, it still doesn't change that story I was giving on the front end of what might be the cause. Antidepressants are not going to improve depression, that the, the depression, uh, essentially prodrome that is coming from sleep apnea or from head trauma or from you know, various forms of abuse, alcoholism, whatever. They're not. They're not going to help it. In fact, they may make it worse. And so in some sense, it's why we really need to push whatever we can to get to this personalized, precise approaches. The second thing is, is that I don't think that, you know, even though we're pushing a lot of these, I don't think we've changed the paradigm of that. That's so interesting because I made that a theme for about two years. Maintain, <laughs> maintain your treatments. If, if 
if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Keep them better. You know, keep just do whatever has gotten people well. It's not routinely done. You know, uh, to this day now, pharmaceutical companies will tell you 50% approximately of those who are given a prescription of antidepressants are no longer taking it at six months. Think about that. <laughs> so um, we have a lot of work to do, you know, and we can do it. But that's... Maybe one, one last question. I know we're at our time. And you said we'll be ripping out now. But I, I noticed that you did not um, discuss um, neuromodulation approaches. No, I didn't yeah. get into so the, many you're things. You're in the heartland of oh, um, yeah. neuromodulation. Your thoughts, briefly? Um, I think... I, I, I actually think I, I was staying away from the treatments because there were so many things. I mean, one, I thought I could list a bunch of biomarkers, some of the things that are the hottest stuff. The Hopkins people have come up with gene profiles that they think are clues to uh, certain types of etiology. Uh, it's not proven yet, and yet, yet that would be a whole talk. You, you know, you could, uh, you could end up... Um, having a talk on neuromodulation. We could have strategies on almost all of these. These are the things that we need to do. What is the profile? You are positioned to do some things here because of your skills and expertise in neuroimaging. And uh, where are we going to use cognitive interventions, you know, the ones, the stuff that you do? And, um, and so uh, I wasn't trying to pretend we were covering the waterfront. I was, as much as anything, I was almost trying to say this is a call to action for all of us to really get on this bandwagon of looking for precision, personalized treatments. And uh, if we do, we'll save lives. And you guys are positioned to, with strengths in a variety of arenas to really help lead that way. So, so that's a, actually a wonderful note to end on. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.